All right. Well, good morning, afternoon, or evening, wherever you are in the world. Uh, thank you for coming back to our second segment of Global Ed TV 2017, where we're covering foundational attitudes and projects for global citizenship. Um, this segment is brought to you by the Global Education Conference and Know My World. And we're really excited to participate. Uh, as you know, last year we were able to do a series that set up uh, some of the background information about what it means to be globally and culturally competent and the way that that looks for different practitioners. We covered everything from some of the beginning research all the way to assessment practices. So in this particular uh, segment, we focus in more on very specific projects that can be done inside of the classroom to help shift some of those social and emotional attitudes to promote global citizenship uh, for students. So again, this is brought to you by, in part by the Global Education Conference Network. Global Education Conference Network is a collaborative and inclusive worldwide community. Um, it involves students, educators, organizations at all levels, and activities that are designed to significantly increase opportunities for connecting classrooms while also supporting and growing cultural awareness and a recognition of diversity. Uh, I really encourage you to join this community if you're not already a member. Uh, not only do you have great access to uh, teachers all over the world and classrooms all over the world, but also dynamic uh, conference opportunities, free opportunities to present, share the work that you're doing, learn from professionals, practitioners, leaders in the field, um, and also opportunities for things like grants um, and project-based learning um, uh, opportunities as well. So highly recommend joining that. You can find them at globaleducationconference.com. And also, we are here today on behalf of Know My World, and that'll be myself and my uh, co-host Genevieve Murphy. Know My World is a uh, global education resource organization. We focus on the social, emotional, and cultural growth of students and teachers in professional development. Uh, we create scholarship programs twice a year to support teachers in uh, connecting with classrooms all over the world and designing projects and learning the base skills like time management, and evaluation that's needed for virtual exchange. And we also design projects and professional development workshops um, to support teachers in classrooms in continuing uh, social, emotional, and cultural growth in their classrooms. So we're really excited to be here with everyone today. We want to just give a big thanks to our sponsors who are helped uh, to bring this series uh, to, to you. Uh, so, of course, Global Education Conference, Know My World, VIF, which is now Participate, um, a very exciting and well-established organization in terms of uh, cultural competency projects and global competency projects all over the world, and, of course, the Learning Revolution, um, all things uh, about uh, learning and pedagogy and, um, and ed tech as well. So I'd just like to take an opportunity to invite everyone to share where you are in the world. Where are you coming from? Where are you participating from? You'll notice that on the left-hand side of your uh, Blackboard uh, page here, you can see a little tiny nav menu. At the top, there's an arrow. Uh, directly under that is a sunshine icon. And then you'll see also like a, other various tools. I'm going to ask that you click on that sun icon, and then place it over the area of the world that you are, and just give it a click. You can see there's two up there already. And we can see where everyone is participating from. Looks like a few, anybody having some troubles with that? So far it looks like we have Arizona, New York, uh, there's other people in here. If you're having a hard time, maybe you can type it in the chat box. Oh, wait, what do we got? Taiwan, Australia. Awesome. We're covering all the different corners of the world. <laughs> Anybody else? No? Okay. Maybe Canada. Okay. 
Excellent. Yes, we truly do have a global audience and really excited uh, to include all the diversity in this session tonight. All right, great. So I'm going to go ahead, though, and go forward and get us started. So just a brief introduction for those of you that are just joining the series at this point. Um, my name is Lisa Petro. I am the host of this series. I am the co-founder of Know My World, and I am also a curriculum development consultant. I specialize in social and emotional learning, cultural competence, and global education. Um, and I've worked on a variety of uh, curriculums uh, for uh, global education in the world um, and uh, hosted uh, professional development uh, for a variety of countries and institutions as well. And just a quick overview of the series, a little bit of a reminder. Um, this series, again, is looking at those kinds of foundational attitudes that are required uh, for students to really develop a sense of global citizenship in the world. Um, and you can hear about this in lots of different ways. And we talk about this as global competence. We talk about this as cultural competence, multicultural competence. And although um, those definitions can vary, at the heart of it is really our ability to be able to be inclusive and participate and contribute actively in the world in the glo and, and, and also take into account and respect our uh, differences um, and really uh, preserve the things that make us uh, unique. Um, so in this particular series, we're looking at how can, what kinds of social and emotional foundations can promote that sort of um, knowledge, those kinds of skills, and those kinds of attitudes and actions in the world uh, for global citizens. Um, we are basing this off of a very particular laboratory classroom that we've worked with in the past. So this link here will actually take you to an internal report that we've done, an exploratory study, based on some of these projects you're getting in this series. Uh, we've included that link, and we encourage you to please have a look and, and see some of the things we found in the past in, in doing this, uh, these projects. So in this series uh, timeline, we are in part two, as I mentioned. Uh, last month, we looked at cultures in the classroom, cultivating cultural identity with students. And in that, we were focusing primarily on developing a sense of cultural awareness and cultural identity. And this month, we want to build on that. We're going to do a project we call Seeing is Being, so thinking critically about social perspectives, moving students. Uh, now up from just the uh, basis of awareness into something that's uh, more thought and action oriented. And a reminder too, in the first segment we covered quite a bit of ground about the research we used in order to develop these projects in this series. And uh, again, there is a resource package available to you at the end of every segment and you can find uh, this research there, links to this research. But just a reminder, the idea is that we're creating this series based on three primary components of research. The first is intercultural competence. And for that, we looked at Dr. Darla Deardorff's um, model for intercultural competence um, in a way that it includes uh, the baseline of having the kinds of attitudes and dispositions that are appropriate for interculturalism. Uh, the knowledge and the skills that are needed, and then the result of that producing an internal and an external outcome in our students. We've also included uh, social and emotional competence, as seen by CASEL, the Collaborative for Academic Social and Emotional Learning, and focusing on five primary areas of being socially and emotionally competent, self-awareness, self-management, social awareness, relationship skills, and responsible decision making. And then lastly, we've partnered that with King and Baxter Magolda's uh, model for intercultural maturity and supporting students through three primary areas, the cognitive, the intrapersonal, and the interpersonal in order to develop understanding, a sense of self, and a sense of sensitivity, intercultural sensitivity. So from these three bodies of research, we have developed a series that focuses on what we think are the kinds of foundational attitudes that are required for global citizenship in students. Our assessment practices are based on these four key indicators. So this will be the reoccurring uh, indications throughout all of the projects in the series. 
We're looking at the growth of self-awareness in our students, their knowledge of self-identity uh, and their personal reactions through critical thought. We also want to foster a sense of openness, a willingness to really accept people um, from all different kinds of diversity and ideas that might be different from their own in a way that invites a multiple perspective. Uh, we're looking to grow sensitivity, so the intercultural sensitivity, um, things like empathy, the awareness of the needs and responses of others, and managing our own responses and the impact that can have in relationships, and then also adaptability. So um, not only having this kind of awareness and this kind of disposition, but also having the kinds of behaviors um, and cognitive skills that are required to shift behavior and participate in dualistic thinking and also co-construct uh, mutual power and empowerment in a variety of relationships. So these are the four indicators that we're working from. And this is the rubric that we have developed. So again, we supply you with the project plans and the rubric. You can find that at the end of this session. I will post a link for you that will take you to a web page full of resources, links to research, and of course the link to our, our lesson plan template and this particular rubric if you would like to uh, replicate this in your classroom. And so again, we're measuring these four indicated areas of self-awareness, openness, sensitivity, and adaptability, and we're moving from a uh, developmental model from limited to moderate to advanced in students. All of our projects um, focus on a particular flow related to Kolb's model of experiential learning. And so the concept here is that our projects are experiential, they're interactive, they build from a concrete experience that students have that leads them into some sort of reflective observation about that experience. And from that, students can make an abstract conceptualization. They have some ideas of what they think that experience meant and how that experience went and, 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 and steps and how they see that experience shaping new possibilities. And so from there, they can move into an active experimentation with this kind of reflective knowledge and understanding. And again, that will create new experiences going forward. So this is a cycle of learning, and this is the way in which we try to fashion all of our projects in an interactive experiential uh, way. And evidences. Of course, what is a project, what is a learning path without evidence? <laughs> so in terms of evidence, we're gathering four primary areas, and this is essential when you're teaching about cultural competence or global competence, you want to make sure that you cover the whole child and that you gather a collection of evidence, not just uh, reducing a student to one or two abilities, but that you have a profile of who they are and what they contribute to the world. So in the qualitative, from this particular segment, we're going to be looking at expressive arts uh, pieces and also role-playing performances. And in the formative, we're going to look at, of course, the rubric assessments, some journal entries, and then, of course, interviews from the students. At the end of this series, we would be able to really have a look at the quantitative and the summative as well uh, to find out ways that the accumulation of this work has impacted the student over um, a, a more uh, longer period of time, a duration of time. Okay, so. At this moment, I just would like to take the opportunity to uh, introduce my co-host here, uh, the global educator, Genevieve Murphy. Uh, Genevieve is also the co-founder of Know My World. Uh, her and I created this organization together. And she is the elementary uh, teacher and social and emotional learning coordinator uh, for American School Tai Chung in Taiwan. She has a wide range of experience inside of social and emotional learning coordination, English language arts, arts education, and also program coordination um, for teachers. So Genevieve, I'm going to turn it over to you now to do a little background explanation. <laughs> Thank you so much. And hello, everyone. Uh, first of all, can everyone hear me OK? Yes. OK, great. <laughs> Um, as Lisa has mentioned, uh, I would also like to say thank you for joining us today. We really appreciate your time 
and I uh, appreciate you joining us so that we're able to share and collaborate here together. Um, my, as Lisa said, my name is Genevieve Murphy, and I currently teach at AST, which is located here in uh, Taichung, Taiwan. I've been here for about six years. Um, before living here and teaching here, I lived and taught in Japan for three years, and I received my uh, my degree in uh, elementary education uh, from the University of North Carolina at Greensboro. And um, slide that moving. The slide moved for us, Genevieve. It didn't move for you. No. Okay. <laughs> uh, it, didn't move. it did move for us. Um. Yeah, it looks like it's moving for uh, other people in the room as well. Okay. Um. <laughs> okay, let me see. Hey, let me see. I'm gonna just go back. Do you see your your bio here? Yeah. Okay. Now, do you see Know My World Classroom? No. Um. I don't. But hopefully, it will load soon. Um. So, Know My World Classroom is something that we established here since uh, for at least the last three, or this is our fourth year here, uh, using my classroom at AST, my third grade students, um, as we've developed and piloted different programs. And so this is where we did the exploratory study um, last year, or two years ago. And each year we kind of uh, try and implement some of the project, the new projects that we've developed to see what works and what needs some tweaking. And it's been a really wonderful space to be able to operate from. Okay. I can advance slides and, for you. Yeah. Can Please you see decal here? Thank you. Okay, now I see decal. Thank you. <laughs> okay, <laughs> yes. great. I think if you advance the slides it will work because it wasn't a problem size. Okay. So um, jumping back on board, so CCAL, this is a model that we developed at Know My World. And at the beginning, when we started developing projects, and what we realized is that we needed to kind of take a different perspective um, <laughs> on the approach to, to curriculum development. And a lot of times in the education field, we get inundated with this concept of standards and testing and that we need to apply all of these standards and this, that, and the third. And of course, I agree that um, the standards do need to be met in the classroom in order to make sure that you are giving students a quality education experience. However, what we did realize um, was that there's also a big aspect that is missing outside of the academic area, and that is the social and emotional parts. And so we started developing programs that actually focused more on key concepts during the social and the emotional, or key concepts of the social and the emotional, and then kind of working backwards and finding the standards that connect with those lessons. Because you will always find standards that, will, that are relatable. Um, but for me, um, and in our discussions, what we realized was that it's important to teach students how to be people <laughs> and how to be good people and how to really um, understand who they are and how they function so that as they progress and move through life, they're able to apply that skill set in various encounters and situations, various situations that they would encounter. Um, and so that's what we really emphasize in a lot of our programs is the social. Um, and we do that through group discussions and group projects. We have a lot of dynamic classroom uh, dialogue, uh, which is really excellent. And then also um, the emotional. So talking about important topics, but focus on emotion and also making sure that the students feel heard and valued in their, what they're sharing and what they're um, contributing. And then cultural, of course, it's very important for students um, to have a cultural identity 
and also for a classroom climate to have cultural empathy and understanding um, amongst the, the students. And as we said, the academic, of course, is always there. Standards are always connected to our projects and programs. Um, and then the learning outcomes, uh, it's really wonderful to see through the students, their actions, and also just their vocabulary as it changes throughout the year. And then students who I've had in the past who um, come and talk to me and say, you know, I remember this when you learned this in leadership, I remember this, we did this project or whatnot, um, even several years later. So it shows us that these projects and programs are definitely impacting and making a good, uh, creating a good impact on the students uh, who are involved. Do you want to try to advance it, Genevieve, to see if it caught up? And if it doesn't, then I'll just keep going. Okay. Ah, there we go. Okay, great. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so this is um, my school. It's located, as I said, in Taichung, but we're in the foothills of Dokken. So it's really a beautiful location. Um, it is uh, a grades 1 through 12 school, and we it is an international school, so we have a diverse student population, and we do teach a Western-style curriculum. And so with that, uh, we are accredited by WASC, and we are recognized by EARCOACH. We implement Washington State Standards, Common Core Standards, and we are transitioning to next-gen science standards. And of course, uh, focusing on um, 21st century skills is a big part of our teaching um, approach here. And then another aspect is the Esslers. So we uh, focus on these areas of, uh, <laughs> sorry, we focus on these areas of uh, teaching students how to be good um, lifelong learners and applied critical thinking skills, the effective communicators, um, cooperative individuals, uh, global citizens, and response, um, emphasizing responsibility. And these are my students. I currently have 11 students uh, who are from five different countries. And uh, we've got three girls and uh, the extra boys, and they are really, um, I don't know, it's nice to have a small class because there's a lot of individualized attention and uh, we get to really focus on um, hearing each other and, and communicating with each other and it's really a wonderful um, group of students to be working with. I feel very fortunate. <laughs> Okay, so I'll let's just turn it back over to Lisa. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, let's yeah. just jump back in a little bit and talk a little bit about um, the development of this project that we're talking about today. So again, I mentioned we wanted to focus on a scaffolding of learning uh, through these projects, and this is a five-part series, so there's five projects we're building on. Uh, in the last session, we started with cultural awareness, and now we're moving into cultural sensitivity. So in that first project, if you're going to do this in totality in your classroom, when you introduce cultures in the classroom to cultivate their uh, student identity, some of the learning outcomes you are getting, well, you are creating students who are culturally aware and have the ability to be sensitive to others' identities. Uh, also that they connect with themselves and their family on a deeper level so they start to establish what we would call roots. Um, and also that they have a sense of pride of who they are and where they come from. Um, this is actually something that you can see if any of you are familiar with the developmental model of intercultural sensitivity or the intercultural development continuum by Milton Bennett. This is actually a thing. It's a, a stage of development we go through in polarization where um, we end up in a defense mode where we defend our home culture. We say our culture is the only way, it's the right way. Or we can polarize that by taking on a host culture as the right way and renounce a sense of pride and understanding for the local culture we were born into. So that is actually a thing, it's a part of a defense mechanism in that development. 
Um, so from here, we really want to get students to move into their ability to be uh, sensitive, to be aware of differences in perspective, um, to be able to discuss it responsibly and dialogue with others, um, to be sensitive to people's perspectives, to understand the value, why it's important to have a opinion, a point of view in the world, and also being aware of how they could shift their perspective how they might uh, be able to include new information or find new possibilities inside of interculturalism. And so these are our um, scaffolding objectives. And in this particular project, we're going to think critically about those social perspectives and support students in meeting the competency areas of self-awareness and social awareness, as well as cultural sensitivity and cultural view or knowledge of other cultures. So this is the cornerstone. This is really the, the, the big piece of this project. We're looking at shaping an effective intercultural experience for students, that when they come into uh, contact, when they're ex exercising the interpersonal with uh, others, they're able to really be effective and find the value, and more so than the value, find the shared power in the relationship. I mean, interculturalism is really a relationship-oriented action. So this quote is from Carol Dweck. Um, many of you probably know a Growth Mindset. Um, she's a, a very popular researcher in that field. Um, and basically, Carol Dweck talks about, inside of Growth Mindset, children's mental representations, their beliefs or their concepts or ideas, they influence everything inside of the outcome. They in influence their ability to achieve, to have self-esteem, uh, to fight things like depression, to have relationships with their peers. And so what they believe and what they feel and how they see the world really shapes the way in which they interact inside of their world and the way they build relationships with others. Um, so this is a really important piece, and this is why we um, designed a project to focus so heavily. And the way that we can get to the root of these kinds of perspectives and beliefs is through critical thinking. And so you know critical thinking is one of the four C's. It's, it's, it's predominant in curriculum. Um, it's not a new concept. Obviously, it has philosophical roots, but also John Dewey could be considered to be one of the grandfathers of critical thinking. Um, but oftentimes, when we talk about critical thinking in the classroom, we can have a very superficial approach. So what is critical thinking? And this is, there's many definitions. This is something that's highly debatable and it's still uh, argued and examined and investigated and researched. But I took this quote from Robert Ennis, who is a very popular researcher in the field of critical thought. And his definition is critical thinking is reasonable, reflective thinking that is focused on deciding what to believe or do. Now, this is an interesting quote because it's, it's simple. It, it encompasses the process through reflection. It encompasses the logic through reason. But it also encompasses two outcomes, the belief and the action. And when we teach critical thinking in school, we tend to focus on the five W's and the H. Everybody remembers this from elementary school, right? So who, what, where, when, why, and how. And these are our leading questions, our guiding questions to dissect and investigate the world. But critical thinking has two primary functions. And the first one, the obvious one, like the five W's and the H, is the skills portion, right? There's a cognitive process to critical thinking. We focus on something, on information. We analyze it. We ask those five W's and the H. We judge it for credibility. Uh, and we also have the ability to observe all of those conclusions and all of that information and report back on it. This can be likened to Bloom's taxonomy, for example. Another piece of critical thinking that often gets overlooked in the classroom is dispositions. So it's not just enough to have the cognitive process, but it's important that we are aware of our disposition. What do we believe? How do we feel? What are our experiences or learned behaviors that influence the way we approach the critical thought, the kind of information that we're seeking out in the world. And so 
Ennis has a, a belief system that there's three primary dimensions of disposition. And the first one inside of an ideal critical thinker would be getting it right. So inside of getting it right, we're looking at things like um, considering other perspectives, that there's other thoughts out there that exist beyond our own, that we stay informed, we look for information. Also valuing honesty, this is the second piece, that we're clear and, we're, and, we're, and we offer evidence for the information that we found, find. So there's honesty and integrity in the approach that we take to critical thinking. And then lastly, and this is a really important piece when we talk about cultural competence and social and emotional learning, caring about others. Having a disposition when we approach critical thought that's mindful of and considerate of others' feelings, that takes all the perspectives into account, and, and measures those different levels of, of validity and uses that information to make well-informed decisions and conclusions and solutions in the world. And so you can see, in order to be a global citizen, this is an important thing. And it's called this caring critical thinkers. And so having these kinds of dispositions are ideal for critical thought because it influences the way that you approach your investigation and you use those cognitive Skills. Now, the second piece of that is instead of just providing the superficial investigation, like where did this event happen and who was involved, although that's important, Deanna Kuhn, who is another researcher inside of critical thought, talks about meta-knowing. And so we've heard this word a lot, especially in recent years in curriculum development, metacognition, creating metacognition and supporting metacognition in our students. It's not enough to just have inquiry-based learning. Inside of meta-knowing, there's three primary areas of critical thought. So the first is metacognition, and this is the procedural, knowing how. For example, when you have a metacognition about a particular act, driving, you get in the car, you turn the key, you put it in drive, you don't have to think consciously about that necessarily. You have, a, you have a metacognition about how to operate that vehicle. It's procedural, and you move through those steps. So it's a deeper kind of knowing. The next piece is the metastrategic. So she says this is knowing that. This is our ability to call on a variety of strategies, multiple strategies, to execute that procedural act, to execute the metacognition. And then the last piece is the epistemological. And so this is often likened to the deeper, like, existential. How does anyone know? And what do I do about my own knowing? And where does my knowing come from? And these are those larger, deeper questions. So this is the kind of critical thought that really fosters authentic learning in students and that allows them to take a toolkit when they're interacting in intercultural relationships. And as you can see from these three areas, this kind of inquiry, this deep inquiry, inquiry requires social and emotional skills like being self-aware, having a sensitivity to others and their opinions, and being able to manage a relationship so that you don't do something what I would call like the, the highly cosmopolitan attitude. If someone doesn't have the same flow of inquiry or doesn't have the same access to the information, instead of creating disempowerment by maybe excluding them from the conversation or, for example, um, uh, not being able to come to their level of understanding to help them uh, in, in the conversation. I mean, these kinds of things would be important in intercultural relationships, knowing how to execute that kind of, well, again, caring, critical thinking. Okay. So what we're working inside of is a developmental model and this, again, is from Deanna Kuhn, where we want to support students from moving from the evaluative thinking and level, or moving from the realist level of thinking into more evaluative thinking. And so in her developmental model, she portends that in preschool, for example, up to four years old, children are realists. They take things at face value. The sky is blue, so it's blue. That's it. And that as you move out of the realist stage into early adolescence, you become an absolutist, which means that you might have a very 
definite answer, the sky is blue and that's it. But you begin to question why the sky is blue and how it became blue. So you have critical tools to examine and investigate, even though you might land at one very particular end. And then from there, in adolescence, we move into the multiplist. And this is where we start to realize that there are a variety of opinions and a variety of perspectives, and that we almost resolve ourselves to this understanding that, well, if there's a bunch of opinions and everybody's got one, then everybody has the possibility to be right. And so we stop kind of questioning. Interestingly enough, even though she's been able to reduce this to particular age levels, uh, we don't always all grow out of these. And very typically, people stay inside of multiplist. The idea is that we want to move our students in between these stages giving them more of an epistemological foundation for inquiry, so moving them toward the evaluativist, where they understand that assertions are judgments, they're opinions, yes, and everybody's got them. But knowledge can be generated from within. Knowledge can be generated from many different areas of perspective and not just from what we see at face value or the external. And that critical thinking is valued and that, in fact, we use the critical thinking toolkit in order to examine all of the options and know that some assertions do have more validity than others. They're backed by certain kinds of research, data, facts, and information. And we know that we can include all of the opinions in a very caring way while also coming to new understandings and building on those understandings and that information. So this is really our goal. And we're ripe because we have a group of eight-year-olds, as you can see. We have third grade students. And so for them, typically right now, they're in the absolutist. And we're going to help move them into the multiplist and start building a toolkit to be a value to this in the world. So that's how we're moving this project. And we're using the, the Partnership for 21st Century Learning's critical thinking um, components. We're looking at reasoning effectively, using systems thinking, making judgments and decisions, and solving problems. So it meets uh, this particular criteria. The learning outcomes from this project, well, students are able to form and execute critical questions. They're able to demonstrate cognitive thought and response. They can identify the source and impact of personal perspective, and also they can shift perspective in a situation. So they can make that action. So I've included these. Uh, this is an informational slide. Uh, that we have this for you in the presentation, uh, but this is also included. Uh, Genevieve has this in the lesson plan sequence um, so you can see uh, what standards are being met. But of course, this is meeting Common Core, Washington State, and uh, for technology and for arts. And these typically focus on English language arts um, as well. So that's there for you. Okay, so Genevieve, I'm going to turn it back over to you to show some brilliant examples of what this project looks like, how it moves, and what students have gotten from it. Great, thank you. Um, so yeah, as we get started, um, in my classroom, it's creating a safe space is really important. and. Um, it's important to do this so that students feel comfortable in their sharing. And the, if you implement this in earlier grade levels, then it kind of becomes ingrained in their thinking. And as they grow and, and advance in grade levels, they still have that awareness and that skill set of being mindful of others and respectful of others' contributions to the classroom and things like that. So. Definitely um, starting with creating a big space. And these are some of the ways that I do that in my classroom. And uh, one of them is uh, the concept of respect. And we talk about and reiterate this pretty much on a daily basis. So um, just constantly bringing that concept to, to mind with the students and asking them, and are you being respectful of this person if, if they are talking and you talk over them, are you being respectful and things like that. And then also uh, responsibility. 
the this poster down here at the bottom, we are responsible for you, is actually um, a banner that is hanging in my classroom. And I also reference it quite often. So when in third grade, there's just sometimes some drama and she said to tattle on each other and things like that. So it's a good tool to use to just say who you need to be responsible for and things like that. Um, we also do different mindfulness activities. So using a singing ball uh, to bring awareness to their thoughts and to the moment and things like that. Um, and then we talk a lot about active listening. So when others are talking, then we need to listen to what they're saying and not fidget with things or play with things in the desk or draw or talk over them and things like that. So these are a few ideas of ways that you can create a safe space for your students. So I guess uh, a good way to kind of create um, critical thinking skills is to ask questions. And so a lot of what I do with students is ask them open-ended questions, such as <laughs> with this unit, our topic is perspective. And so I begin by asking them, what is perspective? And as an eight-year-old, that's a pretty big word, and a lot of them have not heard of it before. And so using this comic uh, is a good way to kind of help generate that conversation. Um, and so uh, we, yeah, just use this as, as a conversation starter. And from there, um, kind of generate, get the conversation going. And then I ask them to look up the definition. So using the children's dictionaries that we have, they look up the word. And then between the two, both the definition and the comic, we create a dialogue and conversation around that. Because again, as eight-year-olds, um, definitions are often unclear and have a lot of uh, large words that they may or may not understand. So um, this was our first day conversation. And the students were able to really use their critical thinking skills and create some really wonderful ideas around this concept of perspectives, um, which are here on the board. And then through our dialogue, I was able to ask, and using that comic specifically, like, well, which of those two people are right, the guy on the right or the guy on the left? You know, do I have a six or a nine? And they were able to really get that both of them were right, there, there wasn't a right or a wrong, which is something that's really, really critical in understanding perspective, is that there is not a right answer and that everyone is entitled to their opinion and that perspectives often come from where we're standing, which is based on our background, life experiences and our culture and our understanding and things like that. So it was a really great um, conversation that, that we had or discussion that we had. So then we expand that by doing some role playing scenarios. And this is really to tap into more of the emotional aspect and help the students again as they're kind of developing um, their social skills. They encounter a lot of situations that may not be challenging. And um, a lot of times it has to do with their peers. And so creating some scenarios for them to uh, really use to tap into you know, being able to see and understand these situations from another person's perspective um, is a really uh, great great tool and a great resource. Plus, the kids really love <laughs> acting, and they wanted to do this all day long. So um, it's fun to you know, create that enthusiasm within the students. So on this slide, uh, this is really tapping into and connecting with what Lisa was saying earlier about the um, evaluative thinking and critical thinking skills. And this goes beyond like just how does that person feel in that situation, but really evaluating and understanding 
why would they feel that way? And where do those feelings come from? And why is my response what it is, um, you know, if I'm responding in a negative way, where is that coming from? And what is my perspective? Um, and so asking them to not only act out the situations, but then to reflect on those situations and really identify um, you know, where their thinking and where their perspectives come from uh, is really um, very important. So then we have this uh, conversation as well about where do your perspectives come from. And uh, this was a really incredible conversation because, again, these are open-ended questions and it really allows the students to tap into their own thinking and really process, like, where, where do those ideas come from? And so um, they really created a lot of great um, ideas or shared a lot of great ideas. Um, so some of my favorite are that uh, you can choose your perspective uh, if something's not fair, and also from your imagination and, and the way you think. Um, and uh, that you're able to kind of change your, your perspective as well, which is great. So this was another. Um, activity that I did where uh, I had a, another teacher come into the classroom and made sure that she was being very obvious about coming into the classroom and you know, she asked me specific things and she walked over to my desk and picked up a red ball and uh, she was carrying a water bottle when she came in and so just some things that are you know very obvious um, and then she left so her being in the classroom was only, I don't know, a couple of minutes, but then I gave the students this um, handout and asked them some questions about that situation. And the way, the reason that this is important or a good activity to do is that it shows that even though we were all in the classroom at the same time and we all, you know, saw the, the same thing happen, um, a lot of the responses were different and varied or, um, and so it showed that even though we all experience and see the same situation, we perceive it differently and we recall different things and we, different things stood out to us or, you know, we paid attention to different things. So, um, again, just a good way to reiterate the fact that we all have different perspectives and uh, we need to be mindful of and respectful of those perspectives. And these are a few resources that I use in the classroom um, when uh, teaching this concept. Um, they're you know, kid-friendly, third grade level. Um, however, there are, at the end of this presentation, some modifications with higher level uh, books that you can choose to use with your students as well. And this is one example of how I use one of those resources. Uh, we read The Three Little Pigs, and then we read the true story of The Three Little Pigs. So the same story, one from the pig's perspective and one from the wolf's perspective. And then I have them create a Venn diagram and uh, write you know, the similarities and the differences between the two stories. And it's a good way to get the kids to really understand, again, with characters and with uh, literature, um, the concept of, of perspective. So after introducing or kind of reiterating the concept of perspective, I asked them to write about and draw about a time that was difficult or scary for them. And so they kind of think back and reflect on it, something that they needed to do. Uh, maybe it was the first time they did it and uh, kind of how they were feeling at that point in time. And so some examples are when they started in school, another time when they started uh, soccer, they went to soccer practice for the first time, and another one was when they uh, learned how to skate 
for the first time. And again, this taps into the emotional side, so they're able to really identify the emotion that was connected to that um, to that uh, experience, which again is a good way to reiterate um, uh, the emotional aspect. And then we talk about shifting perspective, which is an equally important part of the um, uh, equally important part of the experience. Um, so not only do they need to see something in a negative way um, or having that negative emotion connected to it, but now they can kind of see it from a different angle and kind of change change that experience and their memory of that experience. So the way I do this is by using things like optical illusions. And this, um, are, these are some examples. Um, but the students also are really engaged in this um, activity. And they uh, are able to really see <laughs> how they um, one picture can be seen in two different ways. And they call them magic pictures. And they got uh, really excited once they were able to see how one picture could be seen in two different ways. So we started with the base and the two faces. Um, and some of them really had a hard time. They couldn't, they had no, first they either had no idea what the picture was, or they had two, um, they saw only the two faces. Or most of them saw like the cup or the base in the middle. Um, and so just having that aha moment with them where they were like, oh, now I see, now I understand, um, was fun as, as the teacher. And then uh, I gave them a chance to kind of implement uh, an activity where they go out and um, share their, or investigate perspective um, on their own. So. Uh, it sounds like we might have lost Genevieve, actually. Um, can everybody hear me? Okay. It, it sounds like we lost Genevieve. Okay. For the sake of the, um, for the webinar, I'm just going to go ahead and finish up what she has here. If she jumps back in, she can jump back in. Um, but so, so we don't run out of time. So um, she was explaining having students go out and do student perspectives. So clearly she was able to work them up. They started very simply with just the epistemological investigation of what is perspective, where does it come from, uh, and then she worked them through uh, different kinds of experiences, through dramatic play, through visual art, um, and then led them to their own experience. Um, where they were able to pick a very specific time in their life where something was difficult or scary um, and see if they could apply that, those, that cognitive process and those d dispositions and investigating that and seeing it from a different point of view. So now there's kind of this freedom where they have this toolkit, this, this cognitive process and this disposition process, and they can go out in the world and they can start investigating. And so she has them partner in pairs, which I think is great, um, they can go out together and they can choose the same object, event, experience, um, take pictures of it, document it. Um, so here's the students on the playground, obviously choosing the most large motor experience they could find. <laughs> and um, after experiencing that together with their partner, they can start journaling about it. So they can look at the different perspectives, look at the different experience that they had, and they can apply that to um, some of those more personal situations like being afraid um, or being challenged. Um, for example, this one student is talking about in th these kind of intercultural relationships, coming into a classroom where everybody's new. There's people here that aren't familiar, that come from different places in the world. Again, AST is an international school. Um, so 
they can start applying it to those really challenging experiences. And so you can see that Genevieve gives them opportunities um, to examine the before and the after to make the comparison and the contrast to use um, all of those investigative questions and to call attention to the dispositions that are involved. Um, so it's pretty incredible work. Uh, and so here's some of those examples and what students have got uh, gotten from this perspective exercise. So um, things that they've learned that they need to be more respectful of others, responsible for themselves. They can give concrete experiences, so this isn't something that's abstract for them, but they can say, for example, when I'm studying with my brother and my sister and they're interrupting me and I can be responsible and not get angry with them, I can move away, I can shift the way that, that experience occurs for me, I can make a change, go somewhere calm and quiet um, and call attention that I have the uh, power to um, call attention to my perspective and make a new behavior. Um, so, and yes, exactly, they're learning lots of vocabulary to um, express those feelings as well. And so, that, again, that's part of the um, social management, the relationship management and sensitivity. Uh, another example, um, naming those emotions, um, finding comparisons in other perspectives, um, taking out things that we like, that we, that we want to incorporate from other perspectives, and shifting uh, the behavior. I learned that making new friends can be hard, but if I am friendly to other people, they will be friendly back. <laughs> so again, trying on different ways of looking at the world. And so post-project, um, Genevieve distributed a questionnaire, and she used these student interviews um, to see what kind of uh, longevity an impact this had. So not the next day necessarily, but maybe, you know, a couple weeks later. And so they were able to identify and define perspective where they had not been able to do that before. They could source perspective coming from feelings, ideas, imagination, and, and the slide she showed previously, some of them talked about these things coming from their parents, from their families, from their peers. Um, they can learn that perspective tells them things, uh, gives them information and that they can have control of their behavior, um, that it's important to understand this. Um, I love this. Maybe in the beginning you'll think it's hard, but it'll be fun when you learn it. There are many different perspectives in the world. So this opens them up to that multiplist mentality. And then lastly, it helps you to be a good leader because you can understand other people's feelings and opinions. You can help solve problems. You can share your opinion so you don't have to argue to be a good leader. So they can see this already um, in their future and in ways that they can take this and continue it in various uh, aspects of their life. And so, of course, Genevieve using the rubric to assess where they were in those four key indicators after this project, and so documenting the changes, um, measuring the changes in each one of the students in places where they might have struggled or succeeded, of course, this will play into the cumulative assessment at the end of this series when all five projects have been done, and they can start to identify strengths, so areas to leverage, and then, of course, uh, areas where they can improve, and they'll have tools, they'll know where to look, for example, in uh, perspective or in interpersonal relationships. And so the impact, well, students very clearly went from, from assessing all of this evidence, they went from not having any idea at all about what perspective meant to being able to discuss this topic in great detail with uh, Genevieve and their peers. They were able to apply higher level critical thinking during class discussions, identify reasons why understanding perspective is important and it's a good skill for leaders to have, and also they demonstrated an ability to resolve arguments much quicker. Um, and, and not harbor things, not hang on to things um, or harbor emotions for too long. Um, and so uh, lastly, she was able to add some reflection with them about why perspective is important. And so in here, students were really able to dialogue in an open um, atmosphere about why they saw this impact uh, as something important. Ah, she is back. I didn't see her. Here we go. Genevieve, can you hear us? Yes. Great. I, I picked 
picked up. Um, yeah, I picked up for you. So if you want to just take it on home here, finish up the last piece. <laughs> All right, thank you. I'm so sorry. I uh, just one of those days. Um, so I'm at school, and the internet just decided that it wanted to stop for a minute. So, anyways, my apologies for disappearing unexpectedly. Um, but uh, thank you so much, Lisa, for picking up and, and being able to continue to explain the, the project. And uh, you did an excellent job from what I was able to catch once I logged back in. And yeah, so once, uh, just to wrap up, you know, asking them, asking my students why is understanding perspective important? And again, just one last time kind of taking home that point of, you know, especially in as being a good leader and uh, they were able to identify like the importance of, of perspective. Um, and so hopefully they can take this and apply it um, in their lives and within their situations when they get in arguments with their friends or their sisters or brothers or parents or teachers or, or whatnot. And, um, you know, as life kind of grows different, things at them, they'll, they'll be able to use the skill set and maybe not get so emotionally attached to things if they don't go right or, you know, upset if someone has a different opinion or idea from theirs, they're not able to really apply this concept of um, both the concept of, or both ideas of perspective are right and um, that everyone is entitled to their perspective and their, their opinions. And I'm not able to advance the slides, but I think that might be it. Okay, and then just um, as I mentioned earlier, these are a few modification ideas um, that you can use in the classroom. Uh, digitalizing stories is something that the kids really enjoy doing. Um, I use Story Jumper, uh, but there's another platform, Storyboard, and I'm sure there's lots of apps and different things that you can use too to digitalize their stories. And another thing that I've done in the past, which I haven't done which I haven't done yet with my students this year, but um, writing a class play or a class skit or a class story where they're able to write you know, create the characters and then write their own story about maybe not uh, anti bullying or again something along the lines with different perspectives um, is a good way to give them ownership in a project that helps reiterate this concept. And then <clears throat> lastly, uh, the last slide, uh, which is here, um, are some other books that you can use uh, that talk about perspective or various points of view uh, that might be helpful for middle school and high school students. Very good. Thank you, Genevieve. Mm -hmm. Okay. okay, so we'll just work on out here. Um, as I mentioned, the lesson plan is available for you so that you can follow uh, if you want to use this in your own class. Of course, this is a recorded session, so you can go back to any parts of this um, and, and, uh, and, and use that in any way, any modifications if you have students that are obviously not in third grade, uh, eight-year-old students. So this link here will take you to that lesson plan. Uh, this is the link for uh, the uh, um, resource page. So again, you'll get a full works cited list from all the research that we featured and also uh, the um, any kind of links to any of the images that we used and uh, links to the uh, lesson plan sequence as well. So everything is in there. Oh, and also links to Global Ed uh, Global Education Conference um, and Know My World as well. So all that information will be in there for you. Um, and I realize we went a little bit longer this evening because of the technical difficulties, but um, I do think we could probably take at least, you know, one question if there's a burning question and uh, anybody wants to ask. Let's see, what do we got? Peggy, there was one right there I saw. Uh, ah, here we go, Genevieve. Did your project generate conversations at home between the parents and kids about perspective? So what kind of parent, uh, what kind of feedback do you have about the parent-student relationship? Mm 
That's a really good question. And this, uh, with this project, I actually haven't gotten parent feedback um, or with this year. In the past, I have sent parent surveys home and uh, collected feedback. Um, and I have received a lot of positive uh, comments um, based on, on those questionnaires. Uh, but I'm going to send a questionnaire home now that you brought that up <laughs> uh, for this project and, and see how the parents respond. Uh, however, based on past um, surveys, I do feel that parents are really also appreciate these topics that we are teaching their, their child and uh, they are able to generate conversations at, um, at home around these topics as well. So usually in the past, we've had positive feedback around it, but I can't speak specifically to this project just yet, but I'm, I'm going to send a survey home now that you mentioned it. <laughs> so thanks for that idea. Cool. Thank you, Genevieve. And just to point out, in the very beginning of this session, we talk about the exploratory study that we did in 2015. And in that, there's a full section about parent interviews and testimonials that are in correlation to some of these projects we're featuring. So you could look in there, too, if you were interested in, in getting more um, information from parents. OK. So we'll wrap it up. next. Uh, month. We're going to be back on April 24th with our third part of the series, and we're going to focus on a project that refers to labeling and stereotyping, so the impact of placing names on others. Um, it's sure to be a great session, so we really invite you to join us for the live session. Uh, it'll be 7 p.m. Eastern time. We did have a time change, so I know it'll be a little bit, uh, it's a little confusing, but for sure, please come back and join us if you can. And if you can't, no problem, because they're recorded sessions. And we just want to remind you about some of the upcoming Global Education Conference events. So next month on April 3rd, um, Global Education Conference is holding the Symposium on Global Competencies. You definitely don't want to miss that if you're in the Chicago area. Um, here's the link you can follow and, and, and register to join. And also, again, reminding you to join the community at globaleducationconference.com. You can follow them on Twitter as well and also sign up for um, daily and uh, um, daily updates and news. So that concludes our session. I will be ending the recording. You'll be able to view the recorded session at this address, youtube.com backslash global ed con. And I'll also be sending that out in uh, the Eventbrite um, mailer. Uh, so you'll have that link tomorrow so that you can view it as well. Thank you so much, everyone, for your time. Again, we apologize for the a few extra minutes, and we hope to see you next month. Take care and be well. Thank you.